Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Bori. I'm the project coordinator at Danish Refugee Council Diaspora Program. Um, I can see that many people are joining. Welcome to the webinar. We'll just uh, we'll just wait a few a few seconds so people can can join. Welcome to those joining. We just wait in a couple of minutes and then we will start. Great, and I can see that our panelists are also online. Perfect. All right, as we don't have a lot of time for this session, uh, let me start. So my name is Indrid Bori. I'm project coordinator at the Danish Refugee Council Diaspora Program. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this event. It's organized by the Asia Displacement Solutions Platform, the Afghan Danish Women Association, the Center for Asia Pacific Refugee Studies, and the Danish Refugee Council. We can see some more people are joining, uh, but uh, but we'll proceed. Uh, we have around 100 per 100 person who registered for the event. And let's see how many are joining. Uh, but we had more than 15 countries represented. So we're looking forward for, for, for some good discussion. Today, we will start with a brief introduction to our new advocacy toolkit. Uh, it's especially geared towards diaspora organization. And before moving to uh, our, um, so before moving to a panel discussing the value of diaspora advocacy. The toolkit is part of a series of diaspora toolkits, and we've already made uh, three, one on fundraising, one on community outreach, and another one on networking and alliance building. So we'll we'll copy the, the link to, to all those toolkits in the chat if you want to have a look. Please note that the event is uh, recorded. We will uh, we'll try to post it as well on our, on our websites for future use. Uh, if you have any questions, kindly add them to the chat. We'll try to take a few in the discussion, but as we have limited time, um, we'll not be able to answer all the questions. When we can, we'll try also to answer some in directly in the chat. Thank you very much. And now I will pass in over to uh, Nora Jasmine Ragab and Ellen Dicker, the two researchers and consultants who work on the toolkit for a brief introduction of the toolkit. Nora and Eleni, over to you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for having us. Uh, we are happy to be presenting you the, uh, the toolkit that we produced with my colleague, Nora. Uh, we will just take 10 minutes of your time to quickly walk you through the, the toolkit. Uh, if we can already share the, the presentation, that would be great. And we can move to the next slide. This is the cover page of our toolkit, as you can see. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so why did we create this uh, toolkit? Uh, because we see the growing influence of diaspora actors in contributing to change, uh, not only in their countries of origin, but also in countries of residence and also in the translational space. So uh, we developed the toolkit to provide some practical guidance to diaspora actors and particularly those coming from the fragile, uh, from fragile context uh, to support them in their advocacy work. Our methodology consisted of uh, a desk research of available toolkits uh, on advocacy. We've, we tried to find out different tools and methods and tailored them to the diasporic activist space. We also conducted uh, two workshops uh, where we tried to identify um, learning priorities of advocacy actors in the di diasporic space. And we also had another workshop in the end after we drafted the toolkit to get some feedback and inputs uh, to give it the final shape. And in the end of the, this process, we came up with uh, the table of contents that you can see here, uh, consists of six different sections. In section one, we outline what we mean by advocacy and which approaches uh, can be used. Uh, in section two, we provide an overview of the different stages of developing an advocacy strategy. 
In the third section, we describe, we, we present examples of different methods and tools that can be used at different levels of advocacy with a specific focus on the tools that can be adopted and applied in the diasporic uh, context. And in the fourth section, we discuss the risks of advocacy in fragile contexts based on what we found uh, during our conversations with diaspora activists. Uh, and uh, in the last section, we uh, try to explore a bit uh, the, the, the self-care and emotions in advocacy work, which is often an overlooked aspect uh, in the, the activist uh, spaces. Next, please. Uh, to make the content of the toolkit a bit more accessible, we also uh, used text boxes in different colors. So when you go to the toolkit, you will see uh, a very colorful uh, report, a toolkit with lots of boxes around, which will kind of help you uh, ident like um, make the content a bit more accessible. So each color in the toolkit, each color uh, in these text boxes are representing something different, different type of uh, resources. In the red boxes, you will find relevant tools and guidance uh, to de develop your advocacy strategy and also your action. In the blue boxes, you will see the different concepts and approaches within the advocacy work, but also relating to the diasporic space. In the yellow boxes, you will see different case examples, best practices from different parts of the world, specifically focused on uh, conflict affected countries and uh, fragile contexts. And in the yellow boxes, you will see some additional resources which can help you further with uh, diving deeper into certain areas uh, in de designing your advocacy strategy, but also your action. Next, please. Uh, so we will also try to go through a bit uh, through the sections that we have uh, that I just introduced you briefly. Uh, the, the second section, as I mentioned, the second chapter, or so to say, is the, 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 the part where we try to provide a step-by-step -step approach to developing an advocacy strategy. The title, part of the title is missing, but it's about establishing the advocacy strategy. And uh, in this section, for example, we try to, uh, yeah, uh, we, we outline the different steps, starting with uh, setting up the priorities, like prioritizing the issues, analyzing the context, uh, which continues with setting your theory of change, developing a core message for advocacy, selecting your approach, and also planning, uh, monitoring, and evaluating. And for each step, for example, we try to provide different tools uh, that can help you while uh, designing the strategy. So you can see in this table, uh, the like a brief summary of actually this entire section and the different tools that can be used in every step of the advocacy planning, uh, advocacy uh, strategy planning. We also, I also tried to put an example of the, uh, the boxes that we have, for example, in this section, we have a box with, uh, a, a, an approach, a value-based approach that can be used while designing an advocacy strategy to raise awareness on certain issues. This is just to give you an idea of uh, how uh, this box system that we created will look like in, in the toolkit. Uh, since we have quite limited time, uh, I'll just pass to Nora. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this toolkit. So when we go to the next slide, um, I present a bit of the section three, so the methods and tool for advocacy. And here we really try to touch upon the diversity of approaches when it comes to advocacy. So we want, on the one hand look at the inside track where we discuss the political influence that diaspora actors can leverage through activities such as lobbying and advising country of origin or country of residence uh, actors. And here we really want to provide practical guidance, for example, how to organize a face-to-face -face meeting or how to use letter writing as one way to influence. And the toolkit really tries to provide guidance on how to express our opinions and get our message through. Um, we also look here at the international human rights regime that can provide also a platform where diaspora actors can mobilize support and call for action. 
uh, especially then in the international arena. And we see that as part of your advocacy, uh, advocacy strategy, you can evaluate whether to bring matters to the attention to international or human rights bodies. And there are numerous of international mechanism and the toolkit really tries to discuss different approaches and specifically also provides further resources on that topic. Um, when it comes to the outside track, uh, we discuss uh, the use of media as one essential part of advocacy campaigns. And when it's used strategically, it can really help to raise awareness on our issues, mobilize support and solidarity for our cause. Uh, and here we really discuss different tools and guidance on the mood, um, use of media for advocacy, ranging from press release to online posts and podcasting. So we again try to um, yeah, discuss different tools. Uh, additionally, we also discuss the, the opportunities that diaspora can capitalize on uh, when it comes to expression and protest to indirectly influence decision making. And here the toolkit offers some tips and strategy to increase the likelihood of success, but also sustainability of protests. And we finally discuss also the role of, a role of arts and culture that can provide alternative spaces for raising awareness and advocacy work. And again, I also tried to um, give some examples on the toolbox. So you see uh, here on the one hand, uh, the podcasting uh, training um, as an additional resource, but also the checklist on planning demonstration marches and or rallies. So we always try to really give hand on guidance. When we go to the next section. <clears throat> we discuss the aspects of uh, risk uh, um, and the importance of also having a risk analysis to ensure that uh, our advocacy doesn't bring harm to affect us communities in any ways. And here we also discuss the, the aspect or maybe the uniqueness of diasporas that do need to take into account additional factors as they often operate in a transnational level. So acknowledging that risks are part of advocacy, uh, the toolkit provides some guidance on how to identify them, but also being prepared for them and dealing for them. Again, I gave here some uh, uh, case example or best practice as an example of a tool uh, of a text box, but also here, for example, the importance of resources for dig digital security, which we need to take into account, especially in a digital age. So on the one hand, when we think about risk, we own, we think about more the digital aspects, but then also the importance of uh, accountability and transparency and the consideration of ethical issues. When we go then to our final, section which we want to explore and this is one which I think really was driven also by the discussions in the um, uh, workshops we had. Uh, we see that social and political transformation happening in the country of origin often inspire diasporic actors to contribute to social change and being part of a movement can really be create a shared feeling of weakness is energizing, rewarding, and empowering. But at the same time, often specifically when we think about protected conflicts, a constant exposure to death, displacement, and destruction, not only leads often to a feeling of guilt and obligation to act, but can be also really lead to despair and frustration and resignation. And especially also in the context of rather than uh, diaspora actors may um, uh, yeah, experience uh, exile, displacement, but also instability and insecurity, uh, exclusion, discrimination, and racism. So as a result, advocates may act in a constant mode of reaction in order to address these multiple challenges. And it's hard to work under these conditions often of exhaustion and trauma. So being active in advocacy often means working in high pressure and sometimes even hostile environments so we really also wanted to emphasize on the importance of emotions, but also the importance of um, yeah, self and collective care and providing tools how to maybe transform our anger towards a positive change, but also maybe engage in pleasure activism to celebrate uh, us and our communities. And I think, yeah, 
with this, we conclude the brief uh, insights into the toolkit and yeah, we hope it helps uh, and brings, brings some inspiration for further action. Great, thank you so much, Nora and Eleni. Um, I might just introduce myself quickly before I, I jump in. So I'm Evan Jones uh, and I'm the manager of the Asia Displacement Solutions Platform and I'll be moderating the discussion today. But before I do, I just wanted to say thanks very much to Nora and Eleni. Um, it was an excellent overview of the toolkit. I think you captured it really well, especially given the fact that you only had eight minutes. Um, so you did well. And I know it was the result of a very comprehensive process of engagement with diaspora communities to make it as practical and as relevant as possible, which I think you've, you've really done. Um, as a bit of background, so the toolkit was born out of a uh, joint professional development seminar that was held uh, between the Centre for Asia Pacific Refugee Studies, ADSP and DRC in December 2021. So this workshop was held uh, actually in response to the, the takeover of power by the de facto authorities in August of the same year and the recognition that this change in the sort of the landscape in Afghanistan would undoubtedly result in a growing and influential role for the Afghan diaspora. So we thought that this would be a very timely output for people to be able to, to use in the sort of everyday work. So moving into the panel discussion, um, today we have a panel discussion with three very accomplished individuals. Um, so we have Rez Ghadi, uh, Shahzad Akbar and Mohammed Khatoub. Um, and we thought that this would be a great opportunity to have this discussion um, because we could hear some of the practical experiences from Rez, Shahzad and Mohammed, which will hopefully A, spurn some good discussion today but also hopefully generate some ideas and thinking um, for your own work in your respective contexts. So I'll just provide a bit of an intro into our panelists because I know that maybe everybody's not familiar. So first we have Rez. Um, so Rez is the co-founder of the Centre for Asia Pacific Refugee Studies. She's an international lawyer and also a human rights activist. Rez graduated as a Fulbright Scholar with a Masters of Laws from Harvard Law School, becoming the first code in history to graduate from Harvard Law. Rez is also the co-managing director for Refugees Seeking Equal Access at the Table, RCET, which is a global initiative seeking to solidify commitments from states to enshrine refugee participation in the global refugee regime. Her previous roles include working as a legal officer for the New Zealand Human Rights Commission, as a commercial litigator at New Zealand's permanent law firm, as a lecturer on international law and human rights, and most recently in Iraq as a Harvard Human Rights Fellow, building on cases for the prosecution of ISIS regarding their targeted genocidal campaign against the Yazidis. Rez has a wealth of experience advocating for the rights of refugees at the Global Fora, and she's also the founder of Empower, a youth and refugee-led organization uh, which addresses underrepresentation of refugees in higher education. So welcome, Rez. Um, our second panelist is Shahzad Akbar, so Shahzad is a human rights activist from Afghanistan, currently in exile, and is the executive director of Rawadari, and apologies, Shahzad, if I mispronounced that, um, a recently established Afghan human rights organization. Shahzad is also a visiting scholar at Wolfson College, Oxford, and an uh, academy associate with the Chatham House. Shahzad has a diverse professional background in human rights, media, culture, and youth mobilization. She's a board member for the International Service for Human Rights and a member of the International Advisory Council for the Institute for Integrated Transitions. Shahzad's experience spans establishing and running a consultancy firm in Kabul, supporting Afghan civil society and media in her role as country director of Open Society Afghanistan and working with the government of the Republic of Afghanistan on development issues. Prior to the Taliban takeover of Kabul in August 21, Shahzad was the chair of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. Shahzad has advocated for the human rights of Afghans, a dignified and just peace, and accountability for gross violations at the international level, including through engaging with the UN Security Council and UN Human Rights Council. Shahzad's writing has appeared in Afghan international media, including Foreign Affairs, Washington Post, Newsweek, CNN, Al Jazeera, Just Security, and other academic journals. Shahzad completed her Master of Philosophy at Oxford and previously obtained her BA from Smith College in the USA. Thank you, Shahzad, and welcome. And last but not least, we have Mohammed Khatoub, 
Mohammed is a humanitarian activist and human rights defender with 10 years experience in monitoring health related violations. After more than a decade of working in private practice as a dentist in Syria, Mohammed has gone on to hold positions with the Syrian American Medical Society and most recently with IMPACT. In 2022, he was awarded a prestigious research fellowship at the Human Rights Center at the University of California in Berkeley. So thank you all three for joining us. Um, and so to kick off today's discussion, I thought I would pose the same question to you all actually, which is what is for you the specific value of diaspora advocacy? So I might pass it to you first, Rez, and then we'll go in order of the bio. So Rez, Shahzad, and Muhammad. So over to you, Rez. Thank you very much, Evan, and Amana, and Areo, and Afeno, o te ao, tēnā koutou katoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, my name is Rez Gairi. Um, I'm a former refugee, and I come from a Kurdish background. I was born in Pakistan as a refugee, and now I call Aotearoa New Zealand home. And so I greeted you first in Te Reo Māori, the language of the Tangata Whenua Indigenous people of Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, for me, it's, you know, despite being on the other side of the world right now, where I'm calling in from Geneva, Switzerland, it's important for me to start with a pipiha in respect of the place that I was fortunate to be resettled and given a home away from persecution in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so that really grounds me um, as a diaspora community. Um, it, wherever I go, New Zealand is still an aspect of being Kurdish, but also a New Zealander um, as part of my identity. For me, the most important part, um, and, and I think we'll have time to get through to, to the specific advocacy in, um, for me and how that relates to uh, my identity as a, as a diaspora Kurd. Um, but for me, the most important aspect is um, it, it's, it's twofold, I think. Firstly, um, being away from from um, our homeland, uh, it's a sense of um, identity formation and connection to our roots at the same time. So th the advocacy is not just in itself advocacy, but it's also grounding us and connecting us with, with our roots and a, as a way of showing um, where we've come from, the struggles that our people have had, and then also ensuring that we don't let go. So I think that's really an important aspect of the advocacy that I see within the Kurdish specific context. Um, and I will talk more about that a little later on, but that's an important part. I think it's um, sometimes we think about just the impact that we're, we're trying to aim for, the changes that we're aiming for, but also I think the reasons why we begin doing this advocacy as well is really important, the, the way that we're trying to reconnect with our roots. Um, and for, for, for a lot of diaspora, um, either they were very young when their family was resettled or um, they fled their homeland or, you know, whatever path they took have ended up um, in a country outside of their um original context, um, or they've been born in the diaspora, which I see a lot with the young generation that are very active, almost more active than um, some of the previous generation older, for example, my parents' age, who were human rights activists, who were um, uh, fighting for Kurdish independence and Kurdish rights to be recognized. And I see a shift in that generation really um, calming down and not really being as active, but then younger generations, especially those who perhaps had never even been to their homelands, being increasingly active. So I think this aspect of identity formation and connection to your roots um, and a journey of who, are, who am I, what is my story, what is my place and purpose is really fundamental that often we miss. Um, the second point is uh, for for our communities in particular, and, and I think it'll be the case for, for many others, is that the privilege that we have being a diaspora also means that we have the platforms, access to events and people, um, and freedom of expression to talk about these issues. Um, there's still some risk. Of course, we know that these risks are not without limits, especially if you're talking out against quite powerful governments that have people all around the world. Um, but relative, we have more freedom to talk about some of these issues than some of our family and friends that still remain in these really um, 
risky uh, conflict zones. And so it's almost this, uh, the privilege that comes with a responsibility. Someone there may not be able to say this or have even the platform to say it, it wouldn't reach people. Whereas where we are here um, and we're able to be in particular forums um, where we're able to attend international meetings, we're able to set up dialogue with um, whether it's, policymakers, diplomats, government officials, uh, UN agencies, NGOs, academia, but we have these uh, platforms and access to, to bring that voice um, loudly out. So I think for me, these are the two really fundamental um, aspects of diaspora advocacy. And then of course, we're, we're trying to achieve change and that that's gonna take a long time. Um, uh, sometimes it's even beyond our particular um, powers and it may be generations to come, but starting some conversations, shedding light. Uh, an example of this is um, we know what's going on in, in Iran with the, the revolution led by the people on the ground. Um, there's constant internet shutdown. So the, those of us with family there are able to receive news of what's going on and share that um, outside uh, the country. Um, and especially we see in mainstream media, and this is a particular issue for more minority um, populations within these contexts. If I look at the media, there's barely anything about what's happening in the Kurdish parts of Iran, whereas the Kurdish parts of Iran are disproportionately targeted with really brutal military style campaigns um, against these minority uh, Baluch and Kurdish populations within the country. Um, so we can't rely on mainstream media to get information out. Um, and, and so this is a really important part of the, the diaspora advocacy is sharing those stories using our voice, um, lending our voice, as I think I, it would be better to say, because we're not trying to be their voice. They're telling us what is happening. We are just amplifying it in the um, avenues that we have. Um, so I'll stop there. But for me, these are the critical um aspects of um, diaspora advocacy. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Rez. Um, Shazad, I saw a lot of nodding heads, so I'm curious to, to hear your reflection. So I'll pose the same question um, to you, the specific value of diaspora advocacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really um, honored to be part of this discussion. Thank you for, for inviting me, and it's really good to learn about the toolkit. Um, just building on what Riz said, really, because I think she covered many of the, the key elements, I see three specific values, uh, values in our context, in Afghanistan particularly, to um, uh, diaspora advocacy. One is bridging. Um, the second one of it is really about contextualizing. And third is about sustaining international attention. Um, in terms of bridging, I really think one of the key roles and most responsible roles for um, diaspora is to bridge people on the ground, people on the uh, front lines of activism and also on the front lines of oppression because they are being, you know, threatened and intimidated and harassed to policymakers in, in the countries where we are uh, in the countries where decisions and policy, uh, policy decisions are being made that may have implications for our homeland, uh, for our people. Um, so how can we have access, but uh, activists on the ground may or may not have that access um, and they may, may or may not be able to navigate um, you know, the, the organization setups and the kind of um, foreign offices of various governments. So to what extent uh, are we doing this bridging? To what extent when we have an opportunity to speak to a policymaker, we are saying also, okay, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share what I know, but I'd recommend and I can put you in touch with people on the ground who can share their views directly from the situation um, on the ground in a, in, a, in, a, in a safe way, of course, but I think this bridging role is very, very important. And I do worry that sometimes we forget this, that the people, of course, our voices are very important and we have things to say and we have experience and we care about our, our countries, um, our homelands. And But it's really, really important that people who are on the ground are linked to these policy platforms, to UN Human Rights Council, to UN Security Council, to, uh, you know, foreign ministers, um, ETC. So I, I think that bridging role is very important. In terms of the con contextualizing role, is a sort of translation role in a way, let's say, because we have to we have to educate our audiences in the West about in the West, but also in the region. If we are if, if, if Afghans who are in the countries in the region about the 
specific risks that activists face on the ground, the context in which they are operating, but also um, sort of translate the mechanisms, the, the, the uh, institutions um, um, in, in these countries where we live to, to colleagues back home. Uh, and one example of that would be, you know, if if you uh, if you convince um, if you convince a policymaker to listen to a group of activists from the ground, then you can help uh, the activists um, um, prepare in a sense, say, giving the context for where this policymaker comes from, you know, uh, what's her or his political background, um, the influence that this person has in their country. Uh, which kind of recommendations they might be most interested in. So that sort of translation context, contextualizing role is, I think, very important. And we have an added value there because, um, you know, I, when I was in Afghanistan, for instance, we were really focused on, embass on embassies. But since I have, I have come and lived outside Afghanistan for the past over a year, I'm realizing the importance of parliaments and building relationships with parliaments. Um, and I know that it's, so this is knowledge that I can share with my uh, fellow activists back home in terms of them trying to influence members of parliaments here um, in, in, in different countries in the West. And the aspect um, kind of the, you know, the last um, um, aspect is sustaining international attention because people on the ground are taking huge risk and they are really doing a lot. And thanks to social media, they are able to amplify some of that. But because because they are not here, they, are, they don't have the opportunity to, you know, um, in person attend events, in person seek app appointments, in person engage media. Um, it's, it's harder for them to sustain international attention to the cause uh, um, by themselves. So what's the role of diaspora in sustaining international attention? And they can use a variety of tools. The toolkit also talks about this, you know, from uh, social media events to protests to, um, you know, uh, walkouts, other forms of activities, meetings, conferences, where you, the main purpose is to sustain international attention and uh, engage an international audience on the situation in your own country. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Azad. And I think you, you bring out a really interesting point. The, the bridging, I think, very well speaks into Reza's point around lending a voice and how those two pieces interconnect, I think is really essential. Um, Mohammed, I'll, I'll pose the same question to you. And I know that it's always hard being the third speaker. Um, so um, good luck and looking forward to, to seeing what you have to say. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, and and I will start from uh, Sh Shahrazad. Uh, and it being, I feel privileged to be among those great speakers and in this uh, panel. Uh, so, so bridging, is very important uh, value of the diaspora. In Syria, we have very narrow space uh, for civil society organization. Before 2011, there were very few activists and civil society organization who are allowed to, to, uh, 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 to be active inside Syria. Uh, and those should be monitored widely by the Syrian regime. While well, the Syrian diaspora had a bit more space to do that, at least within their communities, at least to be active and to learn and to have the experiences on how to influence decision makers. While in Syria, we didn't have that experience. When 2011, uh, the Syrian diaspora were the first responders for the immediate needs and the, the, the humanitarian needs. And then that was followed by the international organization and the UN. But this is not only the, 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 uh, the, the important value it was experiences, how uh, to write proposals, how to seek fund, how to engage with international actors. So this bridging was very important. And me, myself, I was in Syria. I was born in Syria, raised in Syria, I left Syria in 2014. So I was the local actor, uh, local uh, humanitarian worker inside Syria in 2014. I left, I, I lived in Turkey for five years working in, in the region and working with the diaspora organization. And now I'm in Canada since three years. So I, I see how bridging between those three communities from, from the, the, the same country is very Im, important, have been very important in exchanging experiences because uh, the, the the Syrian diaspora are the the ones who are very familiar with the context and who can express the uh, 
uh, the priorities, can shed light on what's happening in the country, can support local actors. When I fled in 2014, I was invited by uh, Syrian American Medical Society SAMS to uh, to have an advocacy trip in the US. And when I fled, as Shahrazad said, they, they had to educate me about how I can influence the decision making within the capital. How 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 can I work with the UN agencies? I was like I had zero information about about that. Visiting the US for the first time from a country living in the, in the dark, so even electricity was was something new for me. With like two or three years without electricity since the war started, the all the services was cut at the non government areas by the Syrian regime. So we lived in a siege. Uh, the other thing is access to decision maker. I think uh, Syria and diaspora have been active within the differences and the diversity of them, especially be between their locations. Like if you look on, on Syria and diaspora in, in, in Europe, they are a bit different from those in the United States. The United States are more established, have, have been more active, while the Syrian diaspora in the U.S. and in, in the U in Europe were more melted with the with the Arabian communities and more have like the culture of the Arabian community they didn't keep their associations and organizations since the war started in 2011. So they started to establish those and also the differences between the established diaspora before 2011 and the newcomers who fled because of the war, because there's huge differences in their connections to the country and also in their understanding of the context and their activism. The new one want to be active, but don't have the capacity. They still are new, me, myself, three years in Canada, almost like uh, finished uh, logistics, papers, all of, all, all of this, still don't have the time to connect with my community to be active here. While the old one who were before 2011 are much more active. So bridging between those is very important. Uh, so three things, as I said, access, understanding the context and ch exchanging experiences. Uh, the 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 most important thing is sustainability. I think that the diaspora is the sustainable resource of any country, especially when we talk about a very politicized environment like Syria, where like aid might be cut suddenly because of political decision, where uh, where where lights might be completely off. It's like a TV channel when you just change the channel from Syria to another country. No one knows about what's happening about uh, uh, this happened, I think, in, in, in each country with, a, with the armed conflict. Like suddenly we knew nothing about, we don't know nothing about Afghanistan because the news decided to, to have light on, on, on Ukraine. And, and one day well, the lights will be in another country. So our sustainable resource is, is diaspora who are still connected, who, are, who have families, who know what's happening. A very good example was bringing Syrian activists from Syria, like like what's happened to me, inviting them to make advocacy tour, and also Syrian diaspora visiting the country, taking the risk. Uh, international staff won't do that, especially when we talk about the risk of being like uh, subject to uh, arrest or or kidnapped by armed groups or the Syrian regime. They risked themselves. They they they, they went inside. Now, in the, after the earthquake, dozens of Syrian diaspora doctors are flying from the U.S., from Canada, from Europe, from every place, to go to assist. Um, I know there are many international staff want to do, but the Syrian diaspora were quicker in finding ways to enter uh, the uh, uh, the country. Fantastic. Thank you, Mohammed. And I think you you raised a really great point. Um, I think, as you said, the diversity of the diaspora, I think, is absolutely uh, a value. I think sometimes where the challenge of that lies is the diversity as well. You know, you have gender, uh, ethnic background, age, as you said, newcomers versus the old diaspora. And hopefully, I'm sure as we continue along in the discussion, we might hear a little bit about how we've, you know, each respective context been able to navigate that. Um, I know that we're running a couple of minutes behind time, so I might circle back now to Rez um, for another question. So Rez, you've been quite a 
quite an incredibly active voice, um, inspirational, I would say, for many within the Kurdish community around the world in the fight for rights, fairness and justice. You mentioned in your sort of answer to your opening question um, about a reflection on your journey, especially being based in New Zealand and being quite distant, um, you know, from a very young age. So I was wondering if you could tell us maybe a little bit about your success, despite the fact that you've spent the majority of your life in faraway New Zealand. Thanks, Evan. Um, so a little bit, I guess, of positioning of the context so that, you know, I can help make sense of um, the kind of activism and, and the connection that I and other um, um, diaspora Kurds have had. So Kurds um, have an estimated population of approximately 25 to 40 million people. Um, difficult to say because the countries that were located within don't often um, take the data for, for Kurd, Kurdish minorities, but an estimated 25 to 40 million around the world. Um, and so we're the world's largest ethnic group without a state. Today, Kurdistan is divided amongst four different countries. So northern Iraq, which we call southern uh, Kurdistan, Bashur, uh, southeastern Turkey, uh, which is northern Kurdistan, Bakur, northwestern Iran, which is eastern Kurdistan for us, Rojalat, and northeastern Syria, western Kurdistan, Rojava. Um, and I'm not going to get into the, the complex and harrowing history, but amongst many um, Kurds, Across these different regions, an independent Kurdistan has long been the dream of many Kurdish groups, and 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 I'm also not going to get into the reality of whether that's possible or not. Um, very complex legal arguments, but it has been at least um, at like a emotional level, long the dream of many Kurds. Kurdistan remains divided by the repressive uh, colonialism of these states who have, for the large part of history, stifled any attempts by the Kurds of securing freedom against domination and their struggles for the recognition of their minority rights. Um, in, in each of these contexts, uh, Kurds have similarly um, experienced oppression, discrimination, ass assimilation tactics, ethnic cleansing, and then um, in, in extreme situations, genocide at the hands of um, their oppressors. So Kurds um, are amongst one of the most persecuted minorities of our um, of our time. Until very recently, it was illegal to speak Kurdish in Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria, and all uh, vestige of Kurdish existence was banned. Nowadays, even if some of the, the legal um, uh, wording, you know, and on paper has changed and, and there aren't legal bans against the language, we still see the practice. So a number of um, Kurdish teachers were arrested in um, Iran recently for teaching Kurdish language um, in schools to the children. Policies towards Kurds have been described as ethnocide and linguicide, referring to deliberate acts that aim at the extinction of the Kurdish culture and language. Um, and the lack of a sovereign entity undoubtedly distinguishes the Kurdish diaspora from other state-bound diasporas. And, and Kurds are part of this stateless diaspora category in the West. So the notion of statelessness, uh, not having this uh, our own homeland, and a desire for independent Kurdistan in whatever shape or form that, that may be, is what tends to unite Kurds in a diaspora, regardless of the country which their Kurdish um, homeland is uh, located within, so whether that's Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. And this becomes critical to our identity formation. Um, so for Kurdish people, forced exile becomes essential to this heightened sense of longing for our homeland, and it becomes central to the understanding of the Kurdish diaspora as distinct from other diaspora. Kurds who are legally accepted in the host country are often tied to each other um, as members of the same community through various networks, associations, community centers, and foundations that link with their real and imaginary homeland because, you know, we, we, we don't have this um, the state, sovereign state. So Kurds are increasingly um, united through these characterizations of exile um, and, and lack of a, a homeland. And so this identity becomes really a critical form of our advocacy in the diaspora. Um, 
language and cultural practices, of course, are aspects of culture that ground any person strongly in their cultural identity. Um, but for Kurds, because of the banning of the language and the, and the specific policies that have attempted to eradicate the Kurdish language, it becomes even more so a cornerstone of cultural identity of the Kurds. And it becomes a vehicle of identity expression and cultural articulation in the diaspora. Um, so in many cases, it's this also connection of language, um, Kurdish language, that's considered to constitute a central construction block or, or indicator of Kurdish identity. Um, and then for, for diaspora Kurds, Kurdish identity, um, of course, is practiced like other diaspora through culture and language and preservation of cultural um, and language and, and, and these factors and, and traditions. But importantly, the political events and protests that amplifying the voices and the struggles of their homeland becomes a very strong um, connection um, of the Kurdish diaspora. And so participation in such events becomes, again, a key indication of the con connectedness with our Kurdish identity. Um, so for us, uh, um, and, and my personal experience, and I think in that sense, it's not necessarily unique, whether I'm all the way in New Zealand or whether I would have ended up through the UNHCR quota um, resettlement program to Canada or to Sweden or to whoever else my Kurdish family and relatives and friends have ended up, that this is still a main um, connecting factor. The circumstances that I was born into shaped my interest in equality, justice, and human rights. I learned about the denial of human rights and lack of justice before I knew what those concepts meant legally. My family fled um, the gen genocidal campaign against the Kurds, and so as genocide survivors, I also realized that the experiences of my family and those around me were, again, directly related to our identity as Kurds. Um, and and so, you know, this um, framing or um, understanding of our place in the community, um, it, I think, is is what really connected me to fighting for these issues and these rights. So this realization that um, my family had to flee because of the persecution against us as Kurdish minorities, um, then. Um, meant that I I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand um, why don't we have a country? Why can't I point to a map and say this is where I'm from? Why do people not know about the Kurdish history and struggle? Um, and so these, through my own identity crisis, I would say, came this journey of um, understanding more about my Kurdish identity. And I think this journey is quite common amongst a lot of young people in my community from different parts of the world that through through this loss of their homeland and loss of culture and, and persecution against their identity, they go through this journey of trying to understand what did our people go through and why? Why is it like this for Kurdish people? Um, and, and realizing that... Um, all of this happens because purely of our identity and there are intersectional factors as well. So there will definitely be um, other aspects of our identity that exacerbate the, these challenges. Um, and then for me in particular, family of genocide survivors, parents who were very strong Kurdish activists who had to flee because of risk of their lives, then growing up in a refugee camp in Pakistan surrounded by other Kurdish communities who had fled from different parts of um, Kurdistan. And then in the in the diaspora, connecting with Kurdish people um, from these different countries. So as I mentioned, it's not so much to say, you know, this person um, may have come from Turkey or Iraq or Iran or Syria, but the, the minute we find out that the other person is also a Kurdish identity, this strongly roots us and, and this connection is established. Um, and so my journey took me to this uh, frustration of this is the experience of my marginalized community. My parents have come from a long line of strong human rights activists. What can I do to... Um, contribute to the plight of Kurds and make it just a little bit better, just a little bit more known by the international community. And that's what um, drove me to, to a career in law, specifically focusing on um, human rights. Um, and then 
finding out the challenges of other communities, the marginalization and um, the struggles of similar communities around the world that have had an experience like Kurdish people, like Hazara minority groups um, uh, and various groups around the world that have experienced um, these challenges. Though for the one thing that I, I think um, makes it more difficult for Kurdish diaspora in particular for our advocacy attempts is that we have also this challenge of not having a common language. So uh, there are many dialects of Kurdish, such as Kurmanji, Sorani, Zaza, Gorani. And so a person from Bakur, North Kurdistan, situated within the formal borders of Turkey, say from, from the city of Mardin, is not necessarily going to understand a Kurdish person from, um, from Roshalat, uh, Kurdistan, situated, say, in the city of Mahabat in Iran. They're going to have this challenge. And then on top of that, if this person is a diaspora in an English-speaking country and one is, say, in a um, a French speaking country, we again have that challenge of not having the common language of the, the country where we settled in as well. And so it becomes really difficult for Kurdish um, diaspora groups to have this connection um, on the outside in terms of advocacy efforts. So trying to, to, to uh, form groups, for example, like I see Syrian communities, I'm also, I'm always in awe that they have such strong um uh, approaches, the, the strong collaboration, strong partnership, and creating opportunities for one another. And this similar language obviously um, connects them across different parts of Syria because the Arabic is at least the same um, or, or understandable. Um, but then for the Kurdish community, that is an additional challenge that uh, we can't often um, organize ourselves effectively because of this additional language barrier within our own um, communities. So Evan, to, to uh, you know, setting the context and, and responding to your question is that um, it is all of these the factors that has meant me being on the opposite side of the world to my homeland, some odd 30 hour flight away, still connects me very strongly to, to my homeland. And then in my case in particular, which is maybe not the case for all, um, going 360, so going back to the region that my uh, parents fled from to then contribute and work on the ground. So I, I was based um, technically and based in the Kurdish region of Iraq for the last three years, trying to to um, do things um, in a positive way, contribute where I can. But I think, again, it comes back to this diaspora advocacy, this yearning to return to the homeland, even though you've never been born or lived in the homeland. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rose. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, and I, I think we could have a whole separate session purely on um, on engagement through the Kurdish diaspora. So thank you for that. Um, Shazad, I'm going to throw it to you next, and I'm actually going to combine it with a question that we've had come through the Q&A. Um, so the question that I have for you, the first uh, question, was that we all know the situation in Afghanistan for women and girls has deteriorated, quite obviously, since August 21. And section four of the toolkit actually talks about navigating the risks of advocacy in fragile contexts. So I was wondering if you're able to speak a little bit about how you're navigating this at the moment. And do you have any recommendations on how people can balance the need of needing to amplify voices, but simultaneously mitigating risk? And then a second question, which has come through in the chat is, I would love to know how the diaspora can be a bridge between suffering uh, uh, individuals inside Afghanistan and the international community besides lobbying? So a secondary question there. Thanks, Shazad. Okay. Thank you, Ivan. Um, thank you. So on your first question, yes, the, it remains very challenging. So um, at the local level and national level, when it comes to that advocacy at the local level and national level, the approach that my colleagues and I have is that we don't provide any advice. We, we know that we are not in a position to provide any advice to colleagues inside Afghanistan because we don't know the risks as well as they do. They know what the risks are and they know where there is space for negotiation and where there is not. Um, so for, for them, when we, have, when we have conversations about, for instance, advocacy around reopening uh, you know, girls for schools, we on, on their messaging at the local level, they, who should they engage, you know, how to go about it? they are best placed to know and we take 
the lead from them. We ask them uh, that if we are amplifying their stories, how can we make sure that they are safe? But what they do at the local level, at the national level, that's something that we, we are not best placed to advise. When it comes to advocacy at the international level, um, again, we would like that advocacy to be shaped by activists on the ground. So we run our advocacy, for instance, when we are working on a report, we like to run our recommendations of our report with um, activists that we know inside Afghanistan and say, what do you think? What needs to be added? You know, What else do you want the world to hear? And we may not always agree, uh, there are there are times that we don't agree, but we always want to make sure that it's something that they have an input uh, on. But then in terms of how to amplify their own specific messages, do no harm comes first. So we have we are constantly checking with them if because they also want to be acknowledged. They, are active, they want their activism to be acknowledged. They want to be recognized. I'll give an example of the women protesters in Afghanistan. Women protesters in Afghanistan, they are the biggest um, um, civic resistance against Taliban right now inside the country. And they want this to be known. They want to be recognized as a force. Um, so they want us to talk about them. They want us to highlight their stories at the international fora. They want us to connect them with policy makers and with media outside Afghanistan. But then how and who exactly, you know, on what issues, on all of these, we have to consult very closely with them to make sure that as praising a protest or reposting a video doesn't mean that people end up in jail or, um, or tortured or harassed or their family members harassed. Um, in terms of the question uh, in the chat, Besides lobbying, well, there are many ways in which I think there are many ways in which a diaspora can be helpful to, to, the, to the country. I think the questions in this kind of the, our discussion was specific to advocacy, so which is why I focused on advocacy, but also Afghans and diaspora are organizing to send, for instance, aid inside the country. They are making a, an economic contribution. They are helping young girls um, have access to online education. They are um, introducing people for scholarships. They are advocating for human rights defenders in Afghanistan for visas and resettlement. So there are other ways in which the diaspora can make itself useful. Of course, the Afghan diaspora, again, there are multiple waves of it. The diaspora that has recent, I mean, the, the group that's in exile, I think is more appropriate. The group that who has been, you know, recently uh, forced into exile, some of them are still figuring out the logistics of their own lives. So I think we will see this develop. What I see as encouraging and promising is that there's a strong will among Afghans in diaspora to be of help to Afghans inside Afghanistan. To what extent we are being effective, I think we could be much more effective, but there is this will and there's this engagement on how to make our, uh, you know, how to make ourselves uh, of value to, to all Afghans inside the country. Thank you. Thank you, fantastic Shahzad, and, and well done on, um, on time, thank you. Um, Mohammed. I know we only have a few minutes left, but of course we'll, we'll extend by a few minutes to make sure you have the space. But I was wondering if you could reflect on, on the question that we have for you, which was that you've been quite successful in managing to bridge the divide and sort of navigate the nuances between humanitarian and human rights advocacy for stronger impact. And again, if we sort of go back to the toolkit, section two talks a little bit about developing an advocacy strategy. So I was wondering if you can perhaps talk us through how you did this and managed to bridge that divide in, in your own work. Thank you. Uh, so th th this is a very important point because mostly we find that human rights organization are de developing their messages uh, completely separately from humanitarian organization, maybe from a topic that have two faces or or even more. Let's say attacks on health, as example. Um, we need here the humanitarian organization because they are running the, 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 the medical facilities, the health facilities, uh, and they understand the context. They, they, they know the risks. They, uh, they uh, can understand how they can keep providing services regardless of those risks, or at least they understand the risk more than more than human rights organizations who are looking to document the violations. So cooperation between both of them uh, on messages, on documentation, exchanging experiences, understanding the strategies, also the tactics. Let's, in, in a certain stage in 2016, we felt like this is, uh, the, 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 this is a very complicated context and we won't do big achievements in, in preventing attacks on health. So let's work on advocating for fortification of health facilities and to more 
uh, precautions for health facilities for about the the attacks and also training for like uh, safety uh, uh, plans etc uh, so the uh, the joint advocacy between between both was very very important i have uh, many examples when we needed to to bring uh, actors from different sectors uh, together localization of aid as example we found that development organization are working completely separately from humanitarian organization in developing the concept for the country, for, for Syria, especially that in Syria, we have uh, four areas of control. The government is one of them when we have other three. So we have four governments in, in, in one country and it's completely fragmented country. And in each part of the country, the, the concept of localization was developed uh, separately. In addition to that, separately between two sectors, which is development and 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 humanitarian, so it's important to bring those together. Uh, in twenty seventeen, we established the Syrian Civil Society Network platform in the diaspora, which is a platform of nine uh, uh, networks. Uh, each network have a specific mandate or a specific interest. Some of them work on human rights, other work on humanitarian. Each one of them is. Uh, based in a certain country. So some of them are in the neighboring countries, Turkey, Lebanon, and, and, and Jordan, and others are in Europe, others in the United States. So, so bringing those together was challenging, uh, but at the same time was very important to bring people working in, in different sectors uh, together. And, and as, as, a, as a strategy, it's always important to manage expectations about what achievements we can do on the policy level on the technical level we have been doing good achievements especially when we talk about the humanitarian response and i think syrian organization have been very active and built good experience in that regard but like when it comes to changing policies it's very complicated so managing expectation is very important and building strategies on the long term uh, understanding that the change will will take years, even if we are looking for specific and minor changes, it takes long time. A very a very important tactic that we are trying to do is to educate diaspora from different sectors about the uh, the issue that we are working on. If I take an example, <clears throat> the earthquake. When the earthquake happened, the we were in the shock at the first like two or three days looking only on the uh, search and rescue team then we found out that this this uh, this uh, disaster started to unfold for different phases human rights is very was very important from them because there, there were like some violations uh, during distributing aid on both sides of the border in turkey and in syria preventing certain communities from accessing aid but also there was much more bigger uh, uh, concerns about like missing people, about uh, unidentified bodies, about unaccompanying children. And this is happening across the border where we don't have Red Cross participating there. Syrian diaspora, we're looking only for aid. We're looking only for the, the current need, the immediate need, which is very clear. And, and then it was very important to educate people about the human rights issue, about the long term, the recovery, about why this, why the response was very weak, um, apparently because the, the country have been deprived, deprived from recovery uh, fund for, for years. So we have a very fragile aid uh, system. The, the local communities couldn't understand in front of the earthquake uh, all of this uh, had had took from us like weeks to understand to collect information and to build a strategy on the long term only for the the earthquake which made the the crisis much more complicated so thinking on the long term building strategies together thinking together educating diaspora about the needs well, is is are very important tactics to to build the strategies because also we hear from them like now when we talk to to Syrian diaspora in the US we hear from them about what can be done with the with the, with the US government what are the position within the US government toward Syria toward earth to Syria and what we can change and what looks like impossible now within within our resources Perfect. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for that. And I know we've gone a few minutes over time, so 
I, I do apologize and I thank everybody for their patience. Um, and we will probably have to leave it there. So I did want to say, first of all, a quick thank you to Therese Shahzad and Muhammad for your insights. Um, I think you've absolutely given everybody, myself included, a lot of food for thought. And I think it's very much opened up the discussion for how the diaspora can, can be more active, more connected and continue to use the strategic positioning uh, for even greater change. I know that we did miss out on a few questions in the chat box. Um, unfortunately, won't be able to get to them, but do feel free to follow up with Adrian, uh, myself or Mena afterwards, and we'll be able to hopefully answer those for you as well. Um, I'll just pass to Adrian now quickly, who'll say a few closing remarks uh, from DRC. Yeah, from my side as well. Thank you, Evan, for moderating such an engaging discussion. Thank you to our panelists, Rez, Shahzad and Mohammed. Uh, very, very interesting for me to hear you put words on the on the, the value of diaspora advocacy. I'll keep in mind uh, the idea that using this freedom and access that uh, one have in, in the diaspora um, to help bridge the, the need of the society in the country of original ancestry in order in, in often forgotten crisis. So raising the stake and making sure that they are they are stay in the agenda and, and that you are able to help a civil society in country also uh, better advocate for your connection and and contextual knowledge uh, on both sides. I think that was really, really interesting. I would like also to to thank the supporter who financed the, the toolkit. So they're called Global Focus. It's a, it's a Danish organization and Danida, the Danish um, uh, donor as well. We hope that uh, that you liked the discussion and that the toolkit will be helpful. It's available on our website and we've shared the, the link in the Q&A chat if you want to have a look. Uh, otherwise, it's easy to, to find gsc.ngo slash diaspora. So on behalf, on behalf of uh, the Asia Displacement Solutions Platform, the Afghan Danish Women Association, the Center for Asia Pacific Refugee Studies and the Danish First Refugee Council Diaspora Program, thank you again for joining this event. And we hope to see you soon at other events. Have a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much, everybody.